dear students so today i am going to talk about drug eruptions one of the very important topic in dermatology now under this topic we are going to talk about so many different aspects of drug allergy or drug reaction also known as drug eruptions now they are dress syndrome okay let me list them first and then we'll talk about them in detail later on dress syndrome is the short form for drug rash with eosinophilia and systemic symptoms after that we are going to talk about urticaria very common clinical problem extremely itchy type of condition and many of the time it is associated with type 1 hypersensitivity reaction angioedema is another uh, very serious condition where laryngeal edema can occur and the patient has difficulty to breathe and many of the times it is associated with anaphylaxis the most severe type of type 1 hypersensitivity reaction another condition is morbiliform rashes we are not going to talk about that uh, in this lecture hypersensitivity vasculitis we are going to talk there are some important criteria according accordingly we are going to diagnose it then we move on to the important part that is erythema multiforme spectrum okay we talk about erythema multiforme minor and major along with steven johnson syndrome and toxic epidermal necrolysis probably this is the most important part of this lecture in this the childs are very sick usually the child even adult can suffer from this they are very sick and they need special care then we'll conclude this topic by talking about fixed drug fixed drug eruption and photosensitivity rashes okay so this is a relatively a big topic but a lot of important concept you will gain from this topic now let's start with the dress syndrome okay dress syndrome this is drug rash with eosinophilia and systemic symptom now earlier it is it was known as hypersensitivity syndrome but uh, they have changed the name and uh, this is quite a you know a good name to have actually because every uh, clinical feature or manifestations are written here this is caused by the drug okay rashes will be developed there is eosinophilia in the blood and there are some systemic symptom as well so known as dress syndrome so what are the manifestation in the patient this patient typically presents with rash and fever in 80, 87% of the cases or in majority of the time rash with fever occurs and those rashes are mainly erythematous papule and sometimes they can be pustules as well very rarely they may be bulla or even purpura but more common are you know papules and the pustules Now, other severe manifestations regarding the systems are hepatitis inflammation of the liver arthralgia pain in the joint lymphadenopathy okay enlargement of the lymph nodes interstitial nephritis involvement of kidney and hematological abnormality probably some problem in the bone marrow so these are other systemic manifestation of dress syndrome now what are those hematological abnormality now they may be eosinophilia the name itself suggests dress syndrome that e stands for eosinophilia thrombocytopenia decreased platelet count neutropenia decreased neutrophil number and atypical lymphocytosis so this may be present if we do cbc and other symptom may be pruritus very itchy condition nephritis oliguria because of kidney involvement hepatorenal syndrome because of liver involvement now always remember hepatorenal syndrome means in the beginning liver will be damaged then kidneys are suffering arthralgia and asthenia asthenia is weakness probably because of anemia now dress syndrome has multiple differential diagnosis and these are erythema multiforme spectrum also known as steven johnson syndrome and toxic epidermal necrolysis 
hyperosinophilic syndrome as well as Stills disease. Now, let me talk a little bit about hyperosinophil syndrome. Now, what do you mean by hyperosinophilic syndrome? Now, in this condition, the eosinophils are very high in number. Okay, usually more than fifteen hundred per microliter. More than fifteen hundred per microliter. That is a high uh, number of eosinophils in the blood. And along with that some target organ damage may also be there and there should not be any known causes of uh, eosinophilia means this is a diagnosis of exclusion another condition is stills disease now this stills disease is also known as juvenile rheumatoid arthritis with systemic onset or systemic onset juvenile rheumatoid arthritis is known as Stills disease. There occurs rashes, lymphadenopathy, hepatosplenomegaly, and joint pain or swelling as well. So this is Stills disease. So all of these are differential diagnosis. Skin biopsy is non-specific in this case, so we do not usually take. Now, what are these common medications? which are responsible for Dress syndrome. And these are carbamazepine, see here, carbamazepine, phenytoin, phenobarbital, and sulfonamide. These are the medicines which can cause a lot of drug reaction or side effect. Carbamazepine, phenytoin, and phenobarbital, all are anti-epileptic drug. All are very commonly used anti-epileptic drug. Among them, carbamazepine is the most commonly used but it can have some fatal reaction also. Even Steven Johnson syndrome can be caused by carbamazepine. Now, other drugs which are implicated here are lamotrizine, lamotrizine, another anti-epileptic drug, allopurinol, okay? You all know allopurinol. This is the drug which decreases the synthesis of uric acid. So it is used in gout. It is anti-gout medicine. NSAID, everybody know about NSAID. Captopril, okay, Captopril, Inalapril, Ramipril, all of these are AC inhibitor drug. Calcium channel blocker, calcium channel blocker, like nifedipine, amlodipine, nicardipine, nimodipine, these are the example. Fluoxetine, fluoxetine, Anybody can tell me where fluoxetine is used? Yes, guys. Anti-depression, sir. Very good. Sir, right drug. Very good, Abdul Khalik. Excellent. This is anti-depression drug, and this is SSRI, selective serotonin receptor inhibitor. Excellent. Dapsone, anti-leprotic drug. Dapsone. Metronidazole is a type of antibiotic, which is mainly used for anaerobic infection. Minocycline belongs to tetracycline group, tetracycline, and this is commonly used to treat acne vulgaris these days. Okay, doxycycline and minocycline, they are used there. And some of the antiretrovirals, mainly protease inhibitor, can also lead to drug reaction known as Dress syndrome. Now, what happens and what are we doing for the management? Now, it usually occurs two to six weeks after the start of drug. So it takes a bit of time for this reaction to occur, not immediately. If immediate reaction occur, so many other terms are there, okay? So many other terms. If immediate reaction occur to the body, like erythema multiforme, Stephen Johnson syndrome, like that will come into the picture. Treatment is supportive and symptomatic. This is not a very serious condition, so probably supportive and symptomatic treatment is enough. But remember one very important point, the medication which is causing that should be stopped. Okay? It should be stopped. It should not continue the medicine uh, even after this type of reactions. Now, let me tell you some practical scenarios here. Some of the patient, okay, some of the patient, they even don't come to the hospital 
even after developing these uh, reaction and they don't stop taking the medicine as well now when the you know reaction is severe or long lasting then that time they come to the hospital and complain to the doctor you never told me about the side effect it is your fault okay. and that type of thing is very commonly happening these days so it is our job to tell or to remind them about the side effect even if you don't know about individual side effect just tell one sentence here any drug can lead to side effect and if that happens please stop taking the drug and come to me or go to any hospital that is always safe now corticosteroid have been required in some cases but their use is controversial in this situation this is dress syndrome so another important type of okay drug reaction or drug allergy is called urticaria now let me you know highlight some of the important points in the beginning itself urticaria is not only caused by drug allergy it is also caused by insect bite okay insect bite this is another very common cause of urticaria sometimes okay cold exposure heat exposure or even light exposure or even pressure effect can lead to urticaria so there are, this topic is a very vague and a wide one okay though we are including this under this drug uh, you know eruption topic but please don't think only drugs are the causes of urticaria not like that so urticaria means there is areas of raised erythema and edema of the superficial dermis raised erythema and edema of the superficial dermis and these are circumscribed lesion we can feel them we can feel all the you know uh, like for example what is the circumference of that lesion we can feel it everywhere this is called circumscribed lesion and they are definitely raised from the skin because there is edema formation on the superficial part of the dermis this is urticaria and they are very itchy in nature now roughly we can divide this urticaria into acute or chronic variant acute form lasts for less than 6 week and chronic form lasts for more than 6 week and these are some of the urticarial variant okay cold urticaria which is caused by exposure to cold if we touch some cold you know for example ice or very cold water uh, in that regard we can immediately develop some reaction on our skin and it's very itchy a little bit swelling can also occur tightness of the skin occur this is known as cold urticaria heat urticaria is caused by heat exposure to the skin light urticaria also known as solar urticaria caused by sunlight exposure papular urticaria one of the very interesting condition this occurs commonly in children now remember what the children do okay, especially in the rainy season where there are lots of grasses on the floor they go here and there without wearing uh, you know full sleeved cloth and if some insect bite especially on the lower limb then suddenly some rashes will arise is there not even in those in those bite area but some other areas are also affected by the rashes this is called papular urticaria very common in children and another is pressure urticaria so today uh, i'm going to continue the discussion on urticaria which we started from yesterday it's a part of drug allergy or drug reaction now there are different types of urticaria acute urticaria chronic urticaria intermittent urticaria and urticaria of unknown cause or sorry urticaria of non cause so uh, in this class we mainly focus on acute generalized urticaria because that is the most common one now acute urticaria means it lasts for less than 6 week and it can occur with anaphylactic reaction 
this is the most common one another variety is chronic urticaria which occur daily or almost daily and last for at least six weeks or even more than that and it is very unusual to find a cause in chronic urticaria that's why we also call it chronic idiopathic urticaria okay not very important one intermittent urticaria it is an intermittent type of you know illness and urticaria of non cause yesterday also we talked a little bit about them physical urticaria okay pressure urticaria cold urticaria and even cholinergic urticaria so these are the different variety just the classification though let's talk about the most important type that is acute generalized urticaria so see there okay let's talk about it causes are often undetermined regarding generalized urticaria but okay but that may be due to infection any infection in the body can lead to urticaria any proteinous type of food because protein is a allergic you know substance like shellfish fish egg a cheese especially if somebody is eating them for the first time then they can cause allergic reaction and once they become allergic they should not repeat that food again otherwise uh, anaphylactic reaction also can occur regarding the drugs penicillin sulfonamide salicylate ansaid or codeine are common but any other drug can also be responsible for acute generalized urticaria yesterday also i talked about this every human being is different physiologically if one person uh, did not get any reaction that doesn't mean another person will also not get so environmental factor can also lead to urticaria like pollens okay because that's a allergic substance chemical plants animal dandruff which are present inside the home even dust and mold so we have studied like this in case of bronchial asthma because these are antigen in bronchial asthma attack the same uh, pathogenesis occurs in urticaria also both are type 1 hypersensitivity reaction so allergen plays an important role some other causes are contact with nickel like jewelry or button okay rubber contact with rubber like gloves and elastic band industrial chemical and nail polish contact exposure to latex particle exposure to undue skin pressure cold or heat even emotional stress even exercise and sometimes pregnancy and in pregnancy if uh, urticaria occurs we call it pruritic urticarial papules and plaque of pregnancy so uh, these are some of the causes of urticaria but in so many other cases we don't even know what is the cause now about the chronic urticaria some autoimmune disorders may be responsible like sle rheumatoid arthritis polymyositis or even autoimmune thyroid disease like hashimoto's thyroiditis cholinergic urticaria is associated with emotional stress heat or exercise autonomic nervous system is involved there and this type of urticaria is associated with lacrimation salivation and diarrhea okay the urticaria means rashes present in the body along with these rashes if we get this type of finding then maybe it is because of autonomic activation hyperthyroidism amyloidosis polycythemia vera even some malignant neoplasm as well as lymphoma may be associated so these are all the causes of chronic urticaria okay. many of the time we um, even cannot explain why this type of uh, things occurring in this diseases now recurrent urticaria okay look at this important example solar urticaria also known as heat urticaria occurring only on sun uh, uh, you know exposed skin now this is so common problem in many people okay sometimes many people you know uh, explain uh, or complain i should say 
that when I go out in the sun, I feel very itchy, isn't it? Some skin rashes develop in me. This may be one of the, you know, type of solar urticaria. Exercise urticaria is an example of cholinergic urticaria. When we do exercise, we may develop different type of reactions in the skin. Emotional urticaria or physical stress and even water which is known as aquagenic urticaria. Exposure to cold water usually can result in itching and swelling of the finger or that part of the body which comes in contact with cold water. So this is also one of the example of recurrent type of urticaria because it, um, it doesn't disappear after one or two episodes. It keeps on recurring in the patient. Now we are entering into the important part that is pathophysiology of urticaria. Now, regarding the pathophysiology, see here, you, most of the students already know histamine, bradykinin, calicrane, and other vasoactive substances play an active role in the pathophysiology because mostly it is caused by type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. And mast cells and basophils are also actively involved. The important cell is mast, mast cells here. When basophil goes to a uh, subcutaneous area or uh, you know in the tissues, we call that mast cell. There is intradermal edema formation in case of urticaria. This is the pathognomonic feature. Okay, pathognomonic feature, intradermal edema. Because of that intradermal edema, that area is swollen and we can palpate or feel it, palpate or feel it. And this is because of capillary and venous vasodilatation and some of the fluid may leak there. It's a very, very important point. Occasionally, leukocyte infiltration is there and the most common type of neutro, sorry, leukocytes are eosinophil. This is allergic disease, so eosinophil infiltrations are more important. Now, regarding the mechanisms, okay, this is IgE mediated hypersensitivity reaction. That's why we call it type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. But not always, sometimes even non immunological urticaria can occur. Okay, and exactly speaking, we do not know the mechanism, but some speculation or hypothesis are there. Like there may be direct stimulation of the mast cell. Okay, by for example, intravenous contrast dye. This intravenous contrast dye, like iodinated dye, may directly stimulate the mast cell and uh, can cause urticaria. And some other time, even don't know that mechanism. So, this is non immunological urticaria. Type 1 hypersensitivity is not the cause of urticaria in this type. This is the meaning. Now, drugs like aspirin or NSAID can, you know, lead to allergic manifestation and it is not by mast cell mechanism, it is by some other mechanism. So let me uh, explain a little bit about this. You must have studied this before. There are two types of bronchial asthma, extrinsic and intrinsic. Now, extrinsic type of bronchial asthma is commonly caused by allergen. Whereas intrinsic type of bronchial asthma is caused by different things like exercise, like cold air, like use of aspirin or other NSAID type of drug. Okay. And the very exact pathogenesis or mechanism is unknown, but still we can give some hypothesis. Now, aspirin okay, will block cyclooxygenase enzyme. We all know that. It will block cyclooxygenase enzyme. After blocking this enzyme, it cannot, okay, uh, now prostaglandin cannot be synthesized, isn't it? Prostaglandin cannot form after cyclooxygenase enzyme is blocked. What will happen now? Everything is diverted towards lipooxygenase pathway so that leukotrimes are formed. Leukotrimes. And these leukotrimes are responsible for this type of manifestation. So this is one of the speculation, how aspirin and other NSAID are causing allergy 
urticaria or even asthma attack now another type of mechanism may be complement mediated direct degranulation of the muscle and the last one is idiopathic with no known mechanism so these are uh, different points now let's talk about what are the manifestation or clinical features of urticaria pruritus okay, very very important pruritus and rash formation on the body this pruritus is extensive itching on the body and these rashes are very very important one these rashes are edematous type of rash there we can feel them acute urticaria is usually self limited illness it results within 24 hour but it may last up to 6 week okay that's why we call it acute urticaria okay acute urticaria uh, doesn't uh, last for more than 6 week but many of them they result within 24 hour or maximum 48 hour but chronic urticaria last more than 6 week that's why they are called chronic there are no long term consequences of urticaria but we need to make sure the same uh, you know causative agent should not be repeated again like same drugs should not be repeated same food should not be repeated if any exposure to certain things okay if that is giving rise to urticaria we should avoid that these are the important point we should explain to the patient anxiety and depression can be a result if recurrent because it's a very itchy condition okay patient will be very uncomfortable and if it's going on for a longer duration that easily can give rise to anxiety and depression now let's talk about how it looks what are the morphology of those lesions now see there regarding the morphological appearance Okay, they are called wheel. This wheel is a very important point in case of urticaria. All those lesions which we are describing from the beginning of this topic, they are they are dermal edema. They are elevated from the skin. They are discrete lesion. We can feel them. These are called palpable wheel, and they are blanching and raised from the surface. Blanching means when we press them, okay, they will fade away. but when i release the pressure they will come back again this is called blanching the shape may be linear annular or circular or serpiginous linear circular or serpiginous these are the different shape any skin area may be involved and they are usually transient and migratory so these are the different points regarding morphology look at this picture here this is highly typical many of us probably uh, already suffering from or suffered from urticaria look at this lesions here okay we can feel them this is the most important point okay uh, because they are dermal edema and they are very itchy but they are transient type of lesions after 24 to 48 hour even without treatment they may disappear and they may disappear early with the treatment now this is a very closed view look here okay clear cut edema can be seen i can feel this lesion and they are circumscribed and elevated from the surface now some other is extensive involvement of the skin by urticarial rash extensive okay and this person will complain of itching in most part of the body very very uncomfortable situation now this is another closed view look at this edematous area the erythematous and edematous area aortic area okay some other okay here this is cholinergic aortic area okay cholinergic aortic area probably because of autonomic nervous system involvement now this is cold urticaria okay see this ice in the with the contact of ice they have developed this type of rash so cold urticaria and it's itchy as well 
most of the features of urticaria are present in this area cold urticaria now this is heat urticaria exposure to heat has developed similar type of reaction edema in that local area and itching edema as well as itching heat urticaria now, one of the very important you know mechanism occurs in urticaria and that is dermographism this is an important mcq question in different exam dermographism see here this dermographism is when we scratch the skin of those people who are having urticaria then whatever letter we write or whatever way we scratch there the same type of shape will be developed okay so uh, for example here they have written itch okay so by gentle stroking the skin and these are uh, have look like the same letters each there this phenomena is called dermographism i like to compare this phenomena with psoriasis where kovner phenomena is seen kovner phenomena remember kovner phenomena means in the uninvolved skin if there is some scratch or some trauma or something then similar type of lesions will be developed in dermographism okay similar type of situation is there but they occur in different type of lesions another example okay see here the same letter which you have written can be seen now let's let's uh, do some other examination in a patient with urticaria now, physical examination should focus on condition that might precipitate urticaria and these are infection or source of infection in the body like pharyngitis or urti that they may easily cause urticaria look for jaundice enlargement of the liver or tenderness which suggests hepatitis or cholestatic jaundice look for thyroid enlargement or goiter okay because they can be associated with urticaria examine for lymphadenopathy or splenomegaly examine for the joint and skin rashes or palpable rashes that may be a feature of connective tissue disorder which may be associated with chronic type of urticaria examine lung for pneumonia or bronchial asthma feature urticaria and bronchial asthma both are very commonly caused by type 1 hypersensitivity reaction but not all the time there are some other mechanism as well and examine the extremities for any source of infection so what is the meaning of of this slide is do those examination which can give you clue yes this may be a precipitating factor or triggering factor for uh, urticaria let's move on another important you know term is called angioedema angioedema now angioedema looks like urticaria but there is a slight difference between these two term okay and in some of the patient both of these coexist together urticaria and angioedema now let me explain what are the differences in angioedema okay in angioedema the deeper tissues are involved more commonly deeper tissues are involved more commonly you see there whereas in urticaria superficial part of the skin is involved now dermis is involved in urticaria also but probably the superficial part of the dermis is involved there whereas in angioedema deeper parts of the dermis and subcutaneous layer are involved it is clearly written here subcutaneous tissue or sub mucosal tissue lips and eyelid and laryngeal edema these are the hallmarks of angioedema so whenever this type of patient comes to us we we try to examine this area for example whether the lips are swollen or not whether the eyelids are swollen or not and whether the patient is having breathing difficulty or not okay along with other manifestation of urticaria if these are present probably this is a case of angioedema and always admit this patient in the hospital 
and monitor for breathing difficulty because uh, laryngeal edema is very common and that can give rise to breathing problem. Now, for the diagnosis of angioedema, we need to examine three areas. One is skin, which is dermatological exam. Another is GI tract, and third is upper airway. Now, these three uh, parts may be affected by angioedema. Now, see there, what happens on the skin? The skin may look erythematous or red, okay, and it is swollen. And the common areas are face, extremities, and genital. Yeah. Face is the most commonly involved. On the face also, lips and the eyelid, they are most commonly affected. In the GI tract, it, there may be abdominal distension and signs consistent with bowel obstruction because of the edema. Because of the edema on the mucosa and submucosa region, even bowel can be obstructed. In the upper airway, okay, see there, the tongue may be swollen, okay, uvula may be swollen and to make sure that larynx is affected or not we need to go for laryngoscopic examination now laryngoscopic examination can be done in two different way one is called direct laryngoscopy another is called indirect laryngoscopy now direct laryngoscopy is done with the help of laryngoscope the same instrument which you use okay for endotracheal intubation the same instrument but for indirect laryngoscopy, we need a mirror. And through the reflection from that mirror, we, we see what is happening to the larynx. Laryngeal involvement is very common feature in angioedema. Now, look here how the hands are affected. See here, these hands are swollen. Okay, hands are swollen. So this may be a feature of angioedema. And look at the tongue. The tongue is hugely swollen, okay, hugely swollen. And this type of patient should never be ignored. They may not have important feature right now, but we should always uh, admit them in the hospital and a monitoring should be done. Otherwise, they may develop serious breathing difficulty later on. Now, there's a lead swelling upper eyelid is swollen, one of the features of angioedema. Some of the differential diagnoses are there for angioedema, okay, or you can say aortic area as well, erythema multiforme, contact dermatitis, and eczema. They may be the differential diagnosis. Erythema multiforme is mainly caused by viral infection or other infection, and rarely by the drug allergy, we are going to talk about uh, this condition in today's class. Contact dermatitis is a type 4 hypersensitivity reaction. It is caused by contact with some of the allergen. It can be anything actually. And eczema is mainly allergic in nature again. Now, how to manage a case of urticaria? Very, very important practical problem because anyone anywhere can suffer from urticaria. So all of us must know how to manage it. Now see, what are the problems here first, okay? One, is, one of the important problem is itching and very uncomfortable feeling. So we have to give antihistamine to control that. Antihistamine is a very important management. Another is breathing difficulty. And sometimes if there is anaphylactic reaction, there is decrease in blood pressure as well. So enough IV fluid, as well as epinephrine. So in case of anaphylaxis and anaphylactic shock, epinephrine is the drug of choice. It can be given from the subcutaneous route or may be given by IV also in very serious condition. Good amount of IV fluid must be given in case of shock. If antihistamines are not working properly, you can give even corticosteroid, okay? So these are some of the important points. Now see that. So monitoring of the patient. If patient is hypoxic, a pulse oximetry should be done. 
oxygen should be given these are the important antihistamine which we use in clinical practice like diphenhydramine okay diamine hydronate phenyramine these are the important one but diphenhydramine is a very very good and powerful antihistamine it will also induce sleep along with antihistamine effect fexofenadine or loratadine or cetirizine they are relatively less sedative type of antihistamine important one among that list is fexofenadine which is very commonly used these days another is loratadine and cetirizine is a bit sedative actually uh, it depends on the individual some individual develop a bit more sedation than the other simetidine famotidine and ranitidine are also important drug because a similar type of mechanism can increase hydrochloric acid secretion in the stomach and we, we should control it and i already told you if antihistamines are not working properly go for corticosteroid like prednisolone so this is how we treat urticaria now after talking about um, urticaria let's talk about hypersensitivity vasculitis not a very important part of the lecture but nevertheless it is one of the type of drug reaction according to american college of rheumatology okay according to american college of rheumatology or acr there are five criteria okay for the confirmation of hypersensitivity vasculitis and among these five criteria presence of three or more are enough for us because they have a sensitivity of 71 percent and a specificity of 84 percent for the diagnosis so if sensitivity and specificity are high those are the good thing you know they they give us the clear diagnosis now what are those points age more than 16 use of possible offending drug in temporal relation to symptom temporal means time relation for example drug should be taken first and after that these rashes should develop this is called temporal relation third these are vasculitic rash so they are palpable purpura we can feel them okay they are elevated from the skin sometime maculopapular rashes are also there and if we take a biopsy of the skin lesion it will show neutrophil around an arteriole or venule so these are five criteria but only three okay or if more than three it will be nice but even uh, three criteria can give us the diagnosis now which drugs are responsible for hypersensitivity vasculitis now these drugs act like a hapten okay hapten now i'm sure you know the meaning of hapten we have studied this in immunology hapten are very small type of allergen or antigen their size is very smaller they cannot themselves okay cause immunological reaction they should combine with some bigger protein or bigger molecule and then only they can become allergic or antigenic this is called hapten okay now see here most likely due to drug that can act as hapten to stimulate the immune response and these drugs are penicillin pcn means penicillin cephalosporin sulfonamide phenytoin and even allopurinol all of these can lead to hypersensitivity vasculitis now so the additional finding apart from those which were written in those five criteria are fever articarial rashes arthralgia or joint pain lymphadenopathy and low complement level along with high esr this low complement level occurs because probably the complements are used up okay uh, during the inflammatory process so this is hypersensitivity vasculitis now look at the uh, picture here these are the palpable rashes we can feel them on the surface of the skin and they are not painful at all they are not painful rashes okay so these are the picture of hypersensitivity vasculitis now let's enter into very important part of this lecture 
if any question comes from this yesterday also i talked about this urticaria and this iridema multiforme spectrum question comes from here okay so i i need a bit more attention now this erythema multiforme spectrum are widely accepted okay a part of the major type of problem here this is a big term under this multiple different conditions comes like erythema multiforme minor erythema multiforme major steven johnson syndrome and even toxic epidermal necrolysis so it is like one umbrella term and under that umbrella different other conditions comes okay now erythema multiforme minor or major are mainly caused by herpes virus infection hsv1 as well as hsv2 as well as some other infectious disease but rarely if ever by the drug they are not usually caused by the you know drugs they are mainly caused by infection whereas steven johnson syndrome toxic epidermal necrolysis and there is one overlap condition between steven johnson and topical sorry toxic epidermal necrolysis they are probably caused by exposure to the drug and these are far more important from the clinical point of view for us than erythema multiforme minor or major okay so we mainly focus on steven johnson syndrome and toxic epidermal necrolysis in the subsequent slides now what are the diagnostic criteria for erythema multiforme let's talk about them this is an acute self limiting illness it, it may disappear on its own duration of episode last less than 4 week okay up to 4 week it may last even if you do not do anything there are symmetrically and acrally distributed lesion which are typically target lesion okay they are called target lesion or bullseye lesion this is important point means and they exactly looks like that you know they are uh, a rounded lesion and at the central part of the lesion there is one okay small spot there which exactly looks like a bullseye or target lesion this is called erythema multiforme they don't usually involve mucosa mucosal involvement is not common and they occur recurrently okay so let's restart again so i don't have um, you know enough content now so we can finish a bit early so talking about important part of drug reaction or eruption that is erythema multiforme spectrum and in that erythema multiforme spectrum erythema multiforme minor and major as well as steven johnson syndrome and toxic epidermal necrolysis comes now the first two that is erythema multiforme minor and major are mainly caused by infection like viral infection or any other bacterial infection in that sense but the more complicated type that is steven johnson syndrome and ten are mainly caused by drugs this is one of the important uh, feature between them now what are the diagnostic criteria for erythema multiforme this is an acute self limiting illness the duration of episode last less than 4 weeks so it is relatively acute phenomena there are symmetrically and acrally distributed lesion acrally means towards the palm and sole and they are raised okay or typically uh, target lesion or typical target lesions are raised atypical target lesion but the meaning of target lesion is they are main, mainly rounded one and at the center okay they have another slight elevation okay or some spot there it exactly looks like a bullseye or target lesion this is the hallmark of erythema multiforme and they are a recurrent episode and they have very limited involvement of the mucosa now let's see how it looks let's see here look at these lesions these are called target lesions 
or bullseye lesion. These are mainly circular type of lesions, and at the center, okay, there is another spot there. That spot may be slightly elevated as well. Very typical. This is erythema multiforme. Now, what is Steven Johnson syndrome and what is toxic epidermal necrolysis? Let's talk about them. Steven Johnson syndrome is a serious illness. First point. It is a serious mucocutaneous illness with systemic symptom and sign with significant mortality. So we should never ignore this type of situation. A patient looks very ill here. Okay, patient looks very ill. Mucocutaneous illness with systemic symptom and sign and significant mortality is there. Now, there are presence of, please mute yourself. There are presence of flat atypical lesions or which are also purpuric macule with blisters that are distributed mainly on the trunk or widespread. Now, again, most of the lesions, okay, most of the lesions may be typical target lesions, but sometimes they look a bit atypical as well. They don't look like the lesions of erythema multiforme. They may be purpuric, and they may be macular, or sometimes they may be with blister as well. And sometimes they may be there with the target lesions. The important point is epidermal detachment from the skin is less than 10% of the body surface area. This doesn't happen in erythema multiforme, okay? The epidermal detachment doesn't happen there. And epidermal detachment leads to some serious problem like infection in that area of the body. Dehydration can occur, isn't it? So those things are not there in erythema multiforme. That's why this is a serious illness. Another important point, two or more mucosal sites can be involved. Now, these mucosal sites can be oral cavity, okay, can be oral cavity, can be genitalia, genitalia, it can be anal region, okay, so these are the important one. Or even conjunctiva, conjunctiva is a type of mucosal surface. So, two or more mucosal sites can be involved in case of Steven Johnson syndrome. Now, let's see. Uh, some of the picture and and uh, make our concept here. See, this is the picture of Steven Johnson syndrome. See here, this is a mucosal involvement. Look at the lips. So I'm sure oral cavity would also be involved very badly here. These are target lesion. I can see target lesion is still there. See there, bullseye lesion or the target lesion. But at the same time, okay, here is a small blister now. Okay, small blister now. So typical as well as atypical lesions are quite commonly seen in case of Steven Johnson syndrome. This child is very sick, and along with these features, okay, there is mucosal involvement as well. Now this is a closed view of the lips and oral cavity involvement. See here, there is a inflammation going on here. And one more feature, the eating or swallowing is very painful in Steven Johnson syndrome. So the child doesn't want to eat or the patient doesn't want to eat anything because of pain. So we should think of some alternate way of feeding them. In children, if this condition lasts for many days, we have to start NG tube feeding, NG tube feeding. In adult, we can give some, uh, some local anesthetic agent to apply inside the oral cavity and give some cold type of food. Cold type of food are preferred in this situation because it is a painful condition. Now look at this uh, you know, picture, look at the involvement of the eye, okay? or conjunctiva, still the lips are involved, even the anterior part of the nose is affected. So these are the examples of some mucous membrane, okay? Or you can say mucocutaneous junction, 
inside are the mucous membrane, outside the skin. So these are mucocutaneous junction. Involvement of them is very typical in Steven Johnson syndrome. Now, what is toxic epidermal necrolysis then? It is the most severe type of drug allergy. Okay, most severe type. This is a life-threatening illness, which is characterized by high fever and confluent erythema followed by necrolysis. So in the beginning, the skin develops redness, which is called erythema. After some time, we will lose the skin from that area, and that is necrolysis. Now, after necrolysis, okay, there is a detachment of the skin, and this detachment is more than 30% of body surface area in TEN. It is less than 10% in Steven Johnson syndrome, but it is more than 30% in case of toxic epidermal necrolysis. That shows the severity of this condition. Patient with this condition may also have flat atypical target lesion. Okay, flat atypical target lesion. They are also known as TEN with spot. TEN with spot. So that's why, uh, because of this reason, probably they belong to the same spectrum that is called erythema multiform spectrum. Now, rarely extensive epidermal necrosis occur without any discrete target lesion, also. And this is called TEN without spot. That can be a possibility as well. It depends on the person. But we, we can never say which person is going to develop TN with a spot and which one is going to develop TN without a spot. It is probably by chance. Now, there is one category which is called overlap category between Steven Johnson syndrome and toxic epidermal necrolysis. Now, what does that mean? That means the body surface area is involved more than 10%. So it is severe than Stephen Johnson syndrome, but it has not exceeded 30% also. So it is less severe than toxic epidermal necrolysis. So it's in between category are also known as overlap category. So this type of situation can also be there. These are the lesions which develop one to three weeks after the initiation of therapy or the drug and suspected drug should be avoided lifelong. And the commonly, you know, effect, the drugs which are commonly causing this type of reactions are anti-epileptic drug, which are very common. Carbamazepine, okay, phenytoine, these are quite common drug, but frankly speaking, any other drug can also lead to this type of reaction. We can never guarantee this is the drug which will not cause the reaction, okay? Yes, some drugs are very safe. They are because they don't cause a reaction that much. But even if one patient is you know, affected by the drug allergy, for that patient, it is 100%, isn't it? So who knows, okay? Who knows? That person would be the same patient who you are treating right now. So we always talk like this. So before any uh, prescription of the drug, don't forget to tell about the side effect of the drug like this. Now look at this patient now, severe involvement of the body, okay? Look at the erythema. Look at the loss of the skin actually. The superficial part of the skin is already lost from the surface. And if we uh, take the body surface area, it is definitely more than 30%. So toxic epidermal necrolysis. Now what are the complications that can happen? One is, okay? One is hypovolemia because they can lose a lot of fluid from the body. Another is hypothermia also. They can lose heat as well, especially in children that can happen easily than the adult. Third one, secondary bacterial infection would be very common. Now, some point about, before I move further, some point about the treatment part, okay? Now, regarding the treatment, there are two important parts, symptomatic and supportive therapy and the definitive therapy. But sadly speaking, definitive therapy is still controversial. We don't know what are the important drugs we use here. Some of the dermatologists, they argue against corticosteroid, but some say corticosteroid should be used all the time. 
So this is a bit of controversial, but we should start corticosteroid, okay? And watch very carefully about the side effect of corticosteroid. Along with that, proper dressing of the wound should be done, proper feeding of the patient should be done, IV fluid should be given. If there is fever, antipyretics also given, and if there is severe pain, analgesics also should be given. So these all are symptomatic treatment. Now, we are moving towards the end of this topic now. Fixed drug eruption is one of the interesting condition. So let's talk what it is. In this condition, the drug eruption occurs at the same location every time a particular medication is used. And in the history, we should ask this question. Every time we use the medication, same time the lesion will develop. And that lesion can be erythematous, edematous, plaque with a gray center, or it may be a frank bulla, bulla. A bulla means bigger type of vesicle, okay? And when it heals, it progress to dark post-inflammatory pigmented area. It is not a very serious situation. I'm not saying that, but it is one of the complaint from the patient, isn't it? It, it, it makes them worried. Whenever they took that particular drug, then they may develop the same lesion at the same site most of the time. And the common sites are mouth, genitalia, face, and the acral area like palm and sole. And the common uh, drug which leads to fixed drug eruptions okay, are phenophthalene, this is a type of chemical substance, tetracycline, barbiturate, sulfonamide, NSAID, salicylate, and even the drug like tunidazole as well as metronidazole. Tunidazole is uh, quite common in this regard, though it is not mentioned here. Okay, you can add it uh, in this list. Tunidazole is also one of the important drug which cause fixed drug eruption. So remember one important history, then you can clean the diagnosis. That means every time when the patient use the same drug, same type of lesion occur in the same area. This is fixed drug eruption. So here, this type of lesion may be developed. Okay, these are the lesions. Now they are already a bit older. They are not the acute type of lesions. Some changes are already happening. And this is another one. Okay, the palm is affected here. The palm, this is fixed drug eruption. Now the last part of this lecture is a photosensitivity rash okay, on the skin. Now there are two types of photosensitivity rash which are known as phototoxic eruption and photoallergic eruption. Phototoxic and photoallergic, which you can clearly see here. Now, phototoxic eruptions are due to absorption of ultraviolet light, mainly ultraviolet A by the drug, which is accumulated on the skin as well as on the subcutaneous area. So, after observing that ultraviolet light by the drug, there is release of energy and that energy is damaging the cell. This is the mechanism of phototoxic eruption. It looks like a type of sunburn, okay? And sometimes even blister can develop there. So phototoxic eruption, this is the meaning. Now another one is a photoallergic eruption. Now what are these? These photoallergic eruptions are, okay, photoallergic eruptions uh, are a lymphocyte mediated reaction. Now inflammatory cells are involved here and this is also caused by exposure to ultraviolet A. That's why the term photosensitivity. So ultraviolet A is common in both, which converts the drug to an immunologically active compound that activate the lymphocytes and then there is a reaction. So let me explain this again. Because of the exposure to ultraviolet A, the drug which the patients are taking would be converted into 
some immunologically active compound which can elicit allergic reaction now and they can develop allergic reaction by activating the lymphocyte now the common uh, you know type of drugs or substances it can be okay it can be some topical agent means we we apply something there or it can be the systemic agent okay it can be the systemic agent like phenothiazine group of drugs phenothiazine group which are also known as antipsychotic drug sulfonamide or sulfa group of drug and even nsaid so uh, they are caused by topical agent as well as oral agent or systemic agent okay so this is a picture uh, where this is the uh, you know exposed area of our body to the sun most of the time so this is called phototoxic eruption very common problem in many people and many of them okay they are confused this with sunburn but actually uh, this is a type of drug reaction because that patient is taking the drug at the time now at the end okay 